What's up, people? I'm Shaggy, the Opinionated Hippie. This is part four of my reviewing and ranking Jethro Tull's studio albums. Doing it by decades, just because they have 22 of them. Not going anywhere near the Christmas album, though I, that is on my list of Christmas albums to review come December, when Christmas albums should be listened to toed, and reviewed. That rhymed. Uh, two albums in the 60s. I'm going to go through these two, rank them, and then I will drop the entire list, including these two, from 68, their debut, all the way through 2023, their most recent probably their last, I would imagine, being that it, the last couple have seemed just like Ian Anderson solo albums. That's a whole other issue. But anyways, yeah, that's it. Two of them. Uh, then we'll move on. What's the connection to Zappa? There's a number of connections. If you read the comments of these videos that people have thankfully pointed out, uh, but also Eddie Jobson being in both bands, 80s for Jethro Tull, 76, 77 for Zappa being the obvious connection. But here we go. Yeah, let's do it. There's two in the 60s. Which one is my favorite and which one is second? Number two is this one. Uh, number two from the 60s is their debut album. This was the only album to feature um, Mick Abrams on guitar. Martin Barr would join on the second album. Um, this is very much a bluesy rock, late 60s, like maybe even trying to like Somebody had listened to Cream and thought maybe we can do Cream, but we'll we'll mix things up a little bit with the flute. Um, our own sort of Jethro Tull energy, um, but it sounds so much like Cream that uh, there is a also a cover of uh, Cat's Squirrel on here, which was on uh, uh, Cream's debut album, Fresh Cream. This actually might be a better version of Cat Squirrel. It's one of the highlights of the album. It's a good like five and a half minutes. They kind of jam it out. I don't think any of the musicians on here could comparable to Clapton, Bruce, or uh, Baker, uh, but it's a good version of Cat Squirrel. Um, there's a number of pretty good songs. I think the songs that maybe most sound like Tull and don't sound like just generic late 60s rhythm and blues band. Um, the opening My Sunday, My, My Sunday Feeling, really solid song, great Jethro Tull song. Love to play this song on a Sunday when I have that, that Sunday feeling we all get. A uh, Beggar's Farm, uh, a song that Anderson wrote, co-wrote with Abrams, is really good. has has a cream vibe. has that sort of like it's a it's a cream song that I can never. But it has that just cream kind of psych rock, blues rock energy, flirting with a little bit of psych. There, Beggar's Farm is a really good song, and something that would kind of bode well for the next album only, unfortunately. I think they kind of get away from this. Uh, but they cover Rolling Kirk's Serenade to a Cuckoo, which kind of gives away the game for next album's Bore, Bore, B-O-U-R-E, that amazing cover song. Um, and one of the highlights, kind of getting into a more jazzier, using the flute in a more jazzier thing. I think it's a jazzier aspect. I'm lacking words today. Um, but that's a really good cover. I think it kind of stands up and it's pretty good. Um, Dharma for one. Dharma must mean drum solo and one must mean for the drummer. It's like half of the song is a drum solo. Uh, we got Cat Squirrel, which is pretty good. And the song, A Song for Jeffrey and Anderson Original is also one of the highlights on here and is a pretty good song. Uh, the rest of the stuff is kind of just generic. Um, kind of generic. Um you know, late 60s blues rock stuff in, in the vein of somebody like Cream. Um, yeah, not not a bad album, not a great album. And the songs that are like the standouts, My Sunday Feeling, Beggar's Farm, the originals that kind of are a song for Jeffrey are solid Jethro Tull songs, but I don't know if they're on the top of anybody's list. Maybe they are. They're not bad songs. Uh, but yeah, a solid number two, a solid debut. Doesn't really give away the game for, doesn't... You get no sense that this would become one of the prog masters of the 70s. Uh, that game is not given away here. That would come as a surprise later on. Uh, but a pretty good outing for the only one with Mick Abrams. Um, and it would be my number two uh, in the 60s. But if you want to know where it drops in the whole catalog, wait like five more minutes. All right, on to number one. And number one is Stand Up. Came out in 1969. This was, came out in 68. Um, Mick Abrams is gone. Martin Barr has joined the band. We still aren't really into a 
incredibly prog area. We're still flirting with rhythm and blues at some points, but we have a lot bigger of a folk element in there. I think Ian Ander Anderson's somewhat signature sound is in there. Uh, Martin Barr is bringing some just absolutely amazing guitar playing uh, throughout the entire album. And I would argue that going from a first album to a second album, I haven't really kept track of this, but this has to be one of the greatest leap forwards. Like, yes, this was was two and this is one, but there's a big gap between those. And when we get to the complete list in a couple minutes, that gap will show itself more often, more easily, more visibly uh, as I as I rank these two in the entire catalog. But I think this is like pretty much a perfect album. Like I have listened to this. This is one of those albums. I think I've mentioned this was a, with a couple other albums I've listened to. I used to go to dead shows when I was in, I lived, went to school at UC Berkeley. We would go to dead shows at this place called Shoreline, which is about 45 minutes to an hour away. I used to get rides back home with this guy named Andrew who had a full on micro bus, a VW bus. Um, and uh, he generally put on an album and crank it up and we'd drive home. He had great stereo system in the back of this. We drove this van down to some LA shows once. The van broke down in the right outside like San Juan Capistrano and he literally fixed it with a bunch of bungee cords. Like he was under there with bungee cords and he made a run. But the stereo in this thing was amazing. One time after a dead show, we listened to this album and uh, it has been one of my all time favorite albums ever since. I was in uh, enhanced environment for lots of reasons, but this is a perfect album. Uh, both sides open up with some absolutely amazing like blues rock energy. A New Day Yesterday opens up the whole album. Side B opens up with Nothing Is Easy. Just absolutely awesome opening songs. Nothing Is Easy is one of my favorite moments in Death Hotel. It's a simple little thing they do, but at the end of the kind of fun, chaotic, all over the place type jamming that occurs at the end, uh, before they go into the final breakdown, they do this like one, they do this dun, then two, then three, then four, then five beats, then six beats, and then they ride the six beats out to the climactic conclusion. But the way, the, just the dramatic ending, very James Brown funky, J very D'Angelo conducting the band, awesome ending to the song. The second track on both sides is the weird, eclectic, kind of folky, kind of using some different acoustic inner instruments type thing. Uh, Jeffrey goes to Leicester Square, and then Fat Man, not sure about the lyrics of Fat Man, might be some hate going on there. But uh, I mean, Anderson doesn't want to be a fat man. Probably not the most PC song. Uh, but both songs musically are absolutely fantastic. Um, after that, we kind of go our separate ways as versus side A and side B. Side A then has a cover of Box Bure, Bure, B O U R E E. Um, that is beautiful. That is amazing. That is a inspired moment. An awesome cover song for this band. Kind of clearly takes them out of where they were on their first album and sends them off into a different direction. They're covering Bach, you know? Um, friggin' amazing. Um, following Beret, Beret, one of their best songs all time, gonna be on my top 10 song list, Back to the Family, a great little psych rock folky number that's just great lyrics, great performance, great little flute solo in the middle. Then, then Barton Barr comes in with this almost like screaming guitar, uh, just beautiful. And then the gorgeous look into the sun closes outside A. An absolutely beautiful piece of music. P perfect side of music. Jazz rocker to open up. Um, the eclectic Jeffrey Goes acoustic little weird folky number. The beautiful beret. The perfect psych song. Psych pop rock song back to the family. And the gorgeous look to the sun. An almost perfect journey. Nothing is easy opens up side two. Then we get Fat Man. Then we get We Used to Know, which has the melody of the song, which is about, the whole song's about four minutes. The first, almost half the song is this absolutely amazing melody of just, it sounds like a song, it's just, it's of the ages. It sounds timeless. But then Barr comes in with this ending guitar solo thing that is just absolutely amazing and gorgeous and just takes the song in an entirely different direction for the last half of it. I think I think Anderson comes back with that melody for a brief time before we get more guitar. Fantastic. Uh, Reasons for Waiting, another beautiful song. And then we get just the over-the-top rocker with the fake ending and the, 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 the reprise jam out at the end of For a Thousand Mothers. Uh, three amazing rockers. A New Day Yesterday, Nothing Is Easy, For a Thousand Mothers. 
an absolutely perfect psych rock song, Back to the Family, beautiful cover in beret, couple eclectic acoustic numbers, a beautiful ballad, half a ballad we used to know, just a fantastic, almost perfect album. I love this album. It's my number one in the 60s, Stand Up. All right, I'm not gonna put those two on a list because this was was two, Stand Up was one, but we will do my final rankings of all, 22, of all 22 Jethro Tull albums, not going near the Christmas album. Let's do 22 through 11 first. That's what they look like right there. Um, a, just missed out on that top 10 right there. Stormwatch and A, uh, toward the end of the 70s, early 80s, just missing out. War Child also, or mid 70s. Um, and then everything else on here other than this was, which drops at 15. Uh, Crest of a Knave, uh, I, I like the Dire Straits aspect of Crest of a Nave. I think that's pretty good. And there's a couple of really good songs on there. Uh, this was, has a couple of strong songs. Everything after that, you got your 80s, your 90s, your, your 2000, your new millennium, your 21st century stuff. Um, under Wraps. Being the worst, I think there were some songs on Under Wraps that if that was an album, if they had gone back in like the 90s or 2000s and re-recorded it without the horrible 80s sounding stuff, I think Under Wraps has a number of songs that could bump that album up a bit, um, but it's so hard to tell because the 80s production on that, it, it, it's pretty bad. Like, I'm not going to like, I don't want to in any way, I'm not making light of anybody who actually has PTSD, who's actually experienced a real war, but if like, if, if PTSD can be applied to music, like growing up in the 80s and then having to go back and listen to some of the 80s stuff is as close to as it can get, because it just... It is not fun to listen to. But yeah, that's what the top 11, the bottom 11 look like. Uh, 10 through 6, barely missing out of the top 5. Right there, Broadsword and the Beast. Uh, Underappreciated album. I think that's the one on here that maybe I think people should give a, more, a little more love to. It's kind of like Asia had taken over the world for a couple years. And they, they don't sound like Asia, but this is them being like, hey, you can be hard rock. You can throw in a little bit of prog. You can have pop elements. Uh, that opening side tracks on this Beastie and Broadsword are just fantastic. Uh, a really strong album. Strong album. Um, and then we got some late 70s stuff thrown in there. Aqualong, which I don't think it's overrated. It's just one of those albums I've heard way too many times in my life to, to rank it any higher than that. And the awesome Heavy Horses, which means the top five for me are all pretty early albums. Benefit, just so many awesome hooks and riffs. And uh, Martin Barr is just like, he started to flex his muscles a little bit with stand-up. Then he gets to Benefit. And it's like, I got all these riffs. Let's write songs around this. This is, I love being in a band. Um, we got Passion Play, uh, the second of their prog epics. Some absolutely amazing songs in there. The, the Hair Who Lost His Spectacles, fantastic little shaggy dog story. We got Stand Up, which I just rant and raved about, which I think is also kind of an underrated classic. I don't think that gets the love it gets. The ballads on here, like the stuff that... Most of these songs, if they start off one way, they usually end up somewhere different because Barr will come in with his awesome guitar part. But the ballady aspects of these, especially we used to know, uh, which I think Anderson later accused... Didn't really accuse, but he said that... Uh, the Eagles must have stolen the chord progression from this, and though they made a better song, nonetheless, they did. I'm not sure Hotel California is a better song than we used to know. That the melody in the beginning, Martin Parr's, a uh, fantastic song. Number two, Songs from the Woods, another almost perfect album, opens up with a near perfect song in, in the title track. Um, and then number one, Thick as a Brick, uh, just a prog. Uh, a satire of prog that becomes one of the best prog albums ever made. That's how good this band was. So yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's how I would rank them. But yeah, and that's what they all look like in one big long list right there. So anyways, that's what I got. That's my Jethro Tull experience. Um, I also realized as I did with Yes, I don't know if I'm going to do this, but uh, they have a lot of live albums. The only one I know is, is uh, Bursting Out. Bursting Out? Why does that seem weird? The only one I'm really familiar with is Bursting Out, which I think is a pretty good live album. Um, but I think I might revisit some of their other live albums. If I don't know if they're any good, though. So, But that's what I'm going to find out. But anyways, um, but yeah, that's all I got. Uh, thanks for watching this list. Let me know your list rankings, what I messed up on, what should be higher, all that kind of stuff. 
Do what you want. It's a free speech and these are comments. It's YouTube, people. All right. <clears throat> That's all I got. I'm going to cough. I'm going to say subscribe, like, share, comment, do all those things. And go listen to Thick as a Brick or Stand Up or Benefit or any of these fantastic albums. Passion Play. What was the other one I had on that list? I'm forgetting what number two was. Oh, Songs from the Woods. Let me sing you. I'm not going to because I'm not a good singer. Peace. Talk to you later.